Now, beyond a handful of products like M-Pesa and regional companies like Kraft Silicon, 7C Technology and Cellulant, what else has Kenya Silicon Savannah really produced? That's a question that continues to nag critical observers and investors, potential or not, of Kenya's growing tech sector. Now, to get a first-hand look at what it takes to build a world-class tech-driven firm, I spoke to the chief executive of Nylab, Sam Gishuri, earlier on. He started by making a distinction between a plain old IT firm, which, let's be honest, we're not interested in right now, and tech-driven firms, which we are. I think we're a business incubator that uses IT to deliver products to customers. So in a sense, I don't think Uber is an IT company. It's a logistics company. I don't even think Twitter is an IT company as much as it is a media company. A media company it just happens to use IT. IT better than most. I mean, and then you find that Airbnb is in the hospitality industry. It's not necessarily an IT company. And so um, I guess that if you say somebody's an, in IT, then basically you mean they're either doing infrastructure IT in terms of cabling and all of that kind of stuff. They're building softwares for other companies or they're building and selling hardware. Yes, and that's a very limited, you know, or they're doing storage, you know, in terms of providing cloud computing. Cloud computing, higher. yeah, things like that. But otherwise, when you start look at startups and the companies, in, even most of the companies operating in this country, they're not necessarily IT companies. They're just utilizing IT. The main reason why that usually comes up, at least with the context of this discussion, was why is it that Kenya is not producing as many world-class IT products or IT businesses as, say, the US or India, for example? What's holding us back? First, we're young. Uh, five, six, seven years ago, we didn't have high-speed internet access. I mean, so you can imagine, I mean, four years ago, you talk to any startup and you'd find that they didn't even know what a lean startup is or what a term sheet is or what a shareholders agreement in that sense is. So basically we're a very young market when you think about it. I mean I myself, I, I kind of figured out most of the stuff in the last five years. In terms of even trying to build a product that would scale globally, we just started thinking about the last two years when you realize you know, a 40 million market, you know, it's very small. When you narrow down to the people with the smartphones and people who are likely to access your product, people who are likely to need it, then you realize you cannot build. Because it's not 40 million. 40 million is an illusion. It's not 40 million. It's yeah. about three at best. It's about three million. million. And then out of those, probably 10% only have interest in whatever it is you're building. That's 300K. That's a very small market. Now, you can't build for the region because different languages. In the north, you have Arab speaking people. In the west, you have got French speaking people. Different languages. You have different rates in terms of internet access in terms of SMSs, in terms of access to gadgets. So you say you're going to build for Africa as a region, then again, unlike China, they speak one language, unlike India where, well, you know, and America, they speak English, 360 million. You can't really, really do that. Let's talk about that idea stage, because that, I always find that dichotomy quite interesting. Um, no one wants to get in on the risky stage, essentially when ideas are being cultivated, brought up to speed. But there's a ton of money on the other end once an idea has been validated been through the crucible of the market, as it were. How do you convince people over here, um, old money, venture capitalists, private equity, to put cash in, especially at the early stage of the businesses? It's very hard. First, the people with money that can take that kind of risks don't understand the market. Yes, so say somebody exited in Silicon Valley for a $100 million company. I mean, they understand how to build a startup, but they understand how to build a startup in the Valley, in California, in America. So when they come over here, the, the risk is too high. First, they, they have the money, but they don't understand the market, and they don't know who, what, what is likely to happen. And they'll always ask, how do I exit? Yeah. They want to see a clear exit plan. They haven't seen any. Uh, try to talk to them about IP issues. They, they really are concerned about that. Uh, they say, hey, uh, until this country sorts out its intellectual property rights issues, we really, it's a risky place to invest. 